Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part time musician who wants to go full time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. On the Profitable Musician Show, we give you practical tips and strategies to increase the income you're already making and tap into new streams so you can create more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. We also help you think like a business owner so you can keep more of the money that you make. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, author of the best-selling book, The Musician's Profit Path, and host of the popular Profitable Musician Summit. And as you can probably tell, I am obsessed with helping musicians like you to build a rock-solid fan base and income foundation so you can fund the music you are driven to create, share your message with the world, and fulfill your God-given purpose as a musician without stressing out about where your next dollar is going to come from. You've got the talent. You just need the marketing and business tools to take it to the next level. Now let's dive in to the Profitable Musician Show. All right, I am here with Tommy Z, and I'm so excited to talk today about how he has really connected with big brands and been able to offer music for them that they absolutely love that fits with their brand and just, you know, really helps people connect with a brand through music. That is just the coolest thing. And I know that I've experienced that as a consumer. Um, But I think as musicians, we don't think about, you know, how we could do that because that seems like something that's totally outside of our reach. So I'd love to first find out, Tommy, like, how did you get started doing that? Well, like a lot of musicians in our space, and first of all, thanks for um, having me on your show. Really appreciate it. Like a lot of musicians in our space, I fell into it by accident. So I was uh, living two lives at the time when I stumbled into this world. I was a banker on Bay Street, which is like the Wall Street of Toronto. And by nighttime, I was DJing and that was my connection to music. And I was starting to get into music production and things like this. But I was sort of hesitant to take the leap because I didn't really believe that I could make a living making music full time. And that's because my idea of making a living making music full time was basically like a lot of musicians ideas like I'm going to sell music, I'm going to tour. Uh, you know, and I just didn't see myself as a star on stage. I kind of thought I'd love to be in a studio making great music, but you know, how do you get paid for it? And then a friend of mine who was working at an ad agency, uh, he was also a DJ. He actually inspired me to get into DJing and he was working at an ad agency and he said, we're working on his Pontiac Aztec commercial. I don't know if you remember the Pontiac Aztec, but uh, that's not the prettiest car in the world. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but uh, he said, you know, we're working on a campaign and um, I wonder if you can make some music for it. And I said, yeah, you know, sure. It was my first exposure to this kind of making music for a uh, car commercial. And so we did that and um, took a couple of days to create a track, sent it over. They had a couple of comments, revisions. We did, I did the changes. I mean, for me, it was a blast. I was sitting in a studio in the evening, you know, after working at the bank. For me, I would do this for free, you know, making music. And then, uh, yeah, I think the moment everything changed for me is when I got the check from the agency. And um, I was, uh, well, to say the least, I was surprised that basically for a couple of nights of sitting in a studio, I get paid. Uh, I don't remember how much it was of my bank salary, but it was like, you know, two, three months of my bank salary or something crazy like that. (laughs) Wow. So then you think, okay, so I'm basically getting paid the same amount for a couple of nights in the studio that I'm getting paid for sitting in a gray cubicle on the 37th floor Mm -hmm. doing something that I don't have a particular fascination with or passion for. So, so that's how I discovered it. And, um, 
you know, after that, um, I, I basically quit my corporate career and I thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be easy to just keep getting these commercials. I started contacting agencies and saying, Hey, uh, I'm a composer. I have this Pontiac Aztec thing that I just did and nobody was getting back to me. So it was interesting beginning because I, I, I didn't realize that agencies don't actually work with individual composers. And I only got this project because my friend worked at the agency. So yeah, I know. I, I was wondering that, you know, it, it's, it's like that naivete, like you're, you're so excited about what happened and you're like, Oh, I can just keep reproducing this. Right. And that was like yeah. amazing that you took that huge leap, but then obviously then reality set in. Right. So I, I'm excited to hear how you moved on from this. Cause I, I feel like most people wouldn't take that leap. And, and, you know, then they would never yeah. reach where you did. Obviously you went through this time where you're like, uh Oh, like I assumed I could get this and I'm not. So now what do I do? Well, the thing is that there were two things building up within me already, which was one, a distaste for the corporate life and realizing that my ending, my ending up at the bank was basically a result of not really consciously steering my working life. So in other words, I finished university. I didn't really believe music could be my full-time job. So what did I do? I held on to music by being a DJ, but then I got a, a job at the bank, like a lot of people who finish political science do. And that's what I finished political science. Like what else, <laughs> you know, what do you do with that? So I was there for five years at the bank and initially it was enough to give me a fancy business card for me to walk around in these fancy skyscrapers downtown Toronto, you know, you kind of get into it. It's like, oh, cool. You know, I'm here. Like I'm an adult. And I'm adulting. Yeah. I'm an adult. Yeah. And, and, you know, my family was like, oh, look at Tommy. He's got a business card and he's got uh, good benefits and salary. And so initially I enjoyed it, but a few years into it, it's like, you know, everyone of us has an internal radar that tells you, you know, are you on the right path? Do you feel like you were born to be doing this? And, uh, you know, I just didn't feel that. And, and I think after the funny thing is at the bank is that I started getting grumpy because I was DJing at night. I was coming into a <laughs> conference call 9am into the boardroom. I was getting all kind of like short with people because, you know, when you lack sleep and you're sitting in a gray cubicle, you're not exactly enthusiastic. But the funny thing is during these meetings where people were doing the corporate talk, like um, let's ensure that we maximize all available synergies to maximize <laughs> share value, you know, That's people so start funny. saying stuff like that. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, you know, yeah. still hung over from the night before and, and just like, just not tolerating this talk. I'd be like, Bob, what do you mean by this? Like, seriously, what do you mean, Bob? You know, obviously we're trying to maximize. We're trying to synergize. Obviously we're trying to get the stock to go up, but concretely, do you have anything to say to suggest as a tangible next action? And people were, and I thought, okay, I'm going to get fired soon because I'm just like being, you know, this, this, this kind of like, uh, I'm not being politically correct in these mm -hmm. meetings. I'm kind of like being, but I feel like I, you know, people started noticing that and they said, this guy's real leadership material, you know, we, we need to, we need to promote this guy. So the funny thing is, is like, I started getting, you know, into better positions, better salary because of the fact that I was short <laughs> with people and just trying to get to the bottom of things. Um, and when that started happening, I knew for sure that I don't belong here because it's like, Everything was there for me, the benefits, really good salary opportunities, but I just didn't feel like my superpowers, my soul wasn't lining up with this environment. So um, I don't even remember what the question is you asked me because I'm, I'm just unraveling this story, but essentially, um, oh yeah, two feelings were building up inside of me and it was a distaste for the bank and, or a corporate life, let's just say it that way. And then uh, another feeling that was building up is more and more of a desire to take claim of my uh, life, my working life, my career, and to actually act like to actualize what I want out of my working life instead of following certain models or patterns 
which I was doing up until then. Mm. And so, you know, when this opportunity happened, uh, that was a clear sign for me. Okay, this is actually a music related career. I could sit in the studio and make money doing this. And so, yeah, I quit, but that was premature. I didn't get to know the industry. And the result of that was I started doing things the wrong way, contacting agencies. They weren't getting back to me. And I almost thought of going back to the bank. Mm. Um, I called a friend of mine who actually worked at the bank and she said to me, you know, what were you doing all this time? Like you just left, you know, nobody even knows what you were doing. And I realized at that point, wow, it's so important to, and this is like what I teach people today to like write a love letter to your close circle in like major intersections of your life and to let them know what you're fascinated by what your goals are, what you're trying to do, because you never know who can be in the network of your close circle to help you, to help you find your way. And so it was my former colleague at the bank that actually introduced me to someone who worked in advertising in Toronto. And he uh, had a coffee with me and he said, you know, stop calling ad agencies. Like we don't work with individual composers. You know, maybe your friend sent you a job. That's an exception. Normally we call these music production companies that specialize in doing this. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and so from then on, that's when I got traction. I started meeting with the right people. And not too long after, I ended up um, being a part of one of these music production companies. But your question was really like, yeah, how do you take the leap? Because it's a major change. And I remember like really, really struggling with this change, you know? And there were certain people in my life that were actually like, trying to prevent me from Mm -hmm. taking this change. They were saying, you know, I met you as this guy, like you're, you're you're working in a bank and then you're a creative guy. You're a cool guy, but that's on the side. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? You're trying to like be this full time, you know? And that was kind of resonating with my internal doubts. Like, yeah, what do I mean by that? I mean, am I crazy? So your environment can really condition you. And uh, one way that I was able to make the leap is, and I talk about this all the time because I really want people to take out of this story what is going to be relevant to their life if you're thinking about a change, for instance. And that is that it's good to remove yourself from your environment for a few minutes a day so that you can start contemplating and creating a vision of what you would like to happen within you Mm -hmm. because the ordinary world your environment right now which you might not like being a part of like i didn't like going to my gray cubicle every day that's something that's very pervasive and very powerful in kind of automating you like oh yeah it colors your entire worldview yeah it's like you think well this is it like this is how you make a living. It, you know, you should make a living by getting a paycheck every two weeks. You should, you should get uh, benefits. You should have a business card. You should dress well. And I'm not saying that's, you know, for some people that may be right, but I just somehow didn't resonate with it, but I didn't know anything else. And so one of the key things that I started doing that I believe eventually led to this decision, like I had enough power and motivation, conviction to make this decision is I started spending my lunch hours alone. Instead of going with my colleagues from the bank down to the food court of the skyscraper where everybody went to have, you know, combo number six, (laughs) fried rice, whatever, with, you know, sweet and sour chicken. I don't know. The kind of things people eat in the food court at a corporation. I would leave and go for a long walk by myself. You know, half an hour walk to someplace far away from the financial district. I take my journal with me. This is something that I've been doing for like, you know, since my 20s, journaling. And I would start writing my thoughts, my doubts, possible futures, all that stuff. And on those pages basically started coming out, like formulating my desires, like, okay, um, am I just, am I just crazy? Like, is there any hint of potential for me to make this into a full-time career? Do I have musical talents? Do I have craft? Do I have, what, what strengths do I have that I could lend in a different industry other than, than this one? 
And by extracting myself from the environment and affirming myself on these journal pages, I really started to believe in the possibility of this. So, you know, even returning to the bank uh, from my lunch hour spent alone, I already felt like a different person because everybody else was still involved in the day to day. Mm -hmm. But I just extracted myself from the matrix for an hour to <laughs> see and envision the different possibility. And that's what kept me enthusiastic and alive in the afternoon for the rest of the afternoon. And eventually it culminated into that decision. I love um, that because I love the matrix idea because it's so true. Cause if you stay in that world, then you just are constantly like, okay, am I just crazy? Like no one else here is thinking like this and you start doubting yourself and you have no one that like supports the idea of what you want to do. So mm -hmm. if you don't have a, you know, a community, like, you know, I'm so big on building a community where people can go and be like, no, you're not crazy. Like we're doing this and, you know, really building each other up and letting people know what's possible. But if you don't have that, then at least separating yourself out from the reality that you're stuck in is going to help you, you know, commune with yourself and be able to build yourself up in your desires. I love that idea. It's more important than ever. I, I think it's a practice that one should continue even if you've already made your decision and you're on your path because that's how you uh, contribute to the world in a unique way. You know, if we don't separate ourselves from the world and we don't spend time to figure out what's happening inside of us and what are we drawn toward and what are we fascinated about? And then what are all the experiences that we have gone through that mixed together with our fascination can produce a unique voice? Well, I'm sorry to tell everybody listening to this, but you're probably going to end up sounding like everybody else because it's so pervasive today. You know, masters back in the day, the great artists, they, we didn't have mass media. We didn't have social media. So when Matisse was painting, uh, when these guys were painting, they were living in solitude. All it was is their fascination with, let's say, a tree. And then they painted a tree and there was nothing to disturb that. Um, today, you know, I don't think people realize the extent to which we are speaking in the voice of a certain news station or our social media feed. And we're just literally like repeating after those things. So I think today more than ever for, for any person who endeavors to create something unique of their own, the practice uh, of journaling, of separating yourself from the matrix and spending time with yourself, like you said, to commune with oneself, it's not just an option. I think it's almost like, you know, basic survival uh, mechanism. And uh, another thing that I actually always say is try to handwrite something every day because otherwise you're just going to be a font. <laughs> spending all of our time writing on platforms which are predetermined in their look, their feel. We're Times New Roman or we're Helvetica, but there's nothing as unique as like, you know, your own handwriting, right? I mean, that's, that's the most unique expression of you. And I, I find that a handwritten letter to somebody also, it's like the highest expression of individuality and something that makes us human. You know, in these times when we're all looking at screens and and we're immersed in this stuff. So I love that idea. I did, I never even thought of it that way, but that, that that's true. Like everyone's handwriting is totally unique. It's like the way that we, you know, we express ourselves through lyrics in a way that's yeah. completely unique. Right. So if, you know, if, if you know somebody that's like in the position that you were in, would you advise them to take that leap like you did and figure it out? Or would you, say like, you know, if you had met that mentor that was, you know, your, the friend of the friend, right. That helped you that said like, oh, you're doing this wrong. And this is how you do it. If you had met that person while you were at the bank, you might not have landed so hard after you left because you would have been trying to kind of build this up as a yeah. side hustle. And then, and then, you know, you could have a little more smooth transition. Is that what you rec would recommend if musicians want to do something like this? Yeah. I mean, people ask me every day, like, you know, they're excited. They just discovered this new possibility because we're teaching this thing. And they're like, I'm, I'm ready to quit my job. And I'm like, you know what? Do it in phases, you know? So I would recommend that people, yeah, do it in phases. So start 
by first you discover a possibility. Okay, but stay at your day job, investigate the possibility, start learning everything you can about the business so that you get comfortable and that you can talk with any industry professional as if you were a part of the business. Mm. That you can do without being a part of the business. For instance, people can know all about uh, how to score films in Hollywood without being a Hollywood composer. Why? Because you read the books, you watch the YouTube videos. And then when you're talking to someone from the industry, they don't have to know that you've never scored a film before. <laughs> you know, they'll get the impression that, that you, you know what you're talking about. And that's because you're studying, right? So this is actually a long process. I don't want to make it sound like, you know, oh, I discovered an ad uh, that you can compose an ad and then I left the bank and you know, that was it. Like I was building up to, toward that moment by learning how to produce music. And that was years. That was long evenings after coming home from the bank in the studio, just, uh, you know, practicing my craft. And, and so by the time the advertising opportunity came, I already put in a lot of hours into the craft. And therefore, when the opportunity came, that's what my friend asked me. He wouldn't ask me if he knew that I couldn't make good music, right? Right. So, so it's all a process. And I really encourage people to be friends of reality. That's what I call it. Like, <laughs> be a good friend with reality, you know? And what I mean by that is that creative people, we tend to be very impulsive, very spontaneous, very uh, instinctive, driven by the moment, very creative, very emotional. And those can be really dangerous. Right. But with, which is all great for writing music, but not necessarily for starting a business. Not for, and not for life. Yeah. You know, uh, I, yeah. I believe we're given, it's like, I always talk about the two wings, you know, one being reason and one being emotion. Um, and this is what makes us unique as human beings is that we can actually exercise both. You can think about things and you can feel things. Now, these are two wings. If you feel too much, and you don't reason enough, you're going to fly around in circles. And it's the same thing with thinking. If you're all in your head, you're all 100% rational, always analytical, always think it through, but you never feel, I can guarantee, I can guarantee that if you're honest with yourself and when you get older, you might go, mm, I wish I let myself feel a little more. You know, It's like, I feel like I made all the good decisions but maybe I should have lived a little, you know? And so, so, so yeah, use those two things, reason and, 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 um, and emotion and stages, you know, it's like be a friend of reality. And what I mean by this is you have a day job that's paying your bills. Reality is we got to pay our bills. So unless you have someone that's going to come along tomorrow and pay all your bills so that you can do what you love, you need to not have the rug pulled from under you. So, Stay at your job, investigate the new business. The first thing I always recommend is like, see what you can take from your previous story. So for instance, from being at the bank, I took a lot of things. My ability to communicate in the boardroom, my ability to combine business and arts together. Those things are invaluable. Like 10 years later, I'm sitting with a chief marketing officer of Philips or UBS, big Swiss bank, or you know whatever brand. And they're surprised at my ability to be able to speak, <laughs> the boardroom speak, to understand. Right, now you're working with speak. the same kind of people that you were in the boardroom, but you're in a different That's relationship. Right. And that is, that is a great, great point that you do have that experience. Yeah. And so you might, for instance, if you're working in a day job that you don't like, but you want to be a musician or you want to be in the music industry, the first thing I would say is, what skills do you have now and what experience do you have that could be useful in the music industry? Not necessarily as a musician, but it's all like gradual movement over toward at least the arena which, within which you want to play. And that would be the first step, you know. Also, as a first step, I would recommend that if you start getting traction, if somebody's paying you whatsoever in the arena in which you want to play, and that becomes consistent, then you're looking at reality going, okay, the fact is I'm making some money over here. So maybe I can cut down my hours at my day job. Maybe I can offer them to be a consultant so that I'm not there full time, but I give them three days a week and then two days I spend over here. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I don't recommend jumping into any pool 
unless you make sure the water is there. And, you know, um, don't hope that the pool will fill up while you're up in the air and about to land. It might, might not. And so these are difficult times right now and we have to be responsible. But ultimately, I do believe that there are humans who are listening to this right now who not only have a conviction that they belong on a path, of a certain path, but they also have, they are also a friend of reality, that they in fact do have the prerequisites to succeed, the potential, they have the raw material. Sure, there's some development ahead of them, but uh, I, I absolutely believe that there are people listening to this right now that are meant for change and that do belong in the place where they believe they belong. I, I certainly believe that. That's I've awesome. ran into people, who, yeah, I, I, I've ran into people who have, who are not a friend of reality. So what they imagine to be reality is not exactly reality. In other words, they're like, I could be a film composer because my music is much better than Hans Zimmer's. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, it's statements like that. It's like maniacal, huge, over-dramatized sweeps, like, Oh, I could do this. I could. I'd be very careful with that. You know, I, I, I feel like um, the people who make big decisions, um, for instance, like I did leaving corporate career, these are not sudden decisions. These decisions take time. It's like my wife told me the other day. I'm like, I make swift decisions. What are you talking about? Because that's how I think of myself. And she's like, no, actually you don't. Yet like you make big decisions and they're very impactful but you sit years thinking about it. And I realize, huh, you know what? I am actually quite risk averse. I will spend time to think and think and think and to like see all the possible pitfalls. Uh, but eventually when I'm comfortable that I've put everything out in my journal and that I've seen the whole landscape, if the pluses outweigh the minuses, I will make the leap, you know? Yeah, and of course, to the rest of the world, it looks like this huge, you know, massive decision. And, and to you, you know, they don't know what's been going on in the background with the journal and everything. So that, that exactly. makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious, you know, if there are people out there that are a friend of reality and they really would love to do this, um, at least on the side, so they could dip their toe in and see if this is right for them. And I know that you have a course around this. So we're going to put that the link to that below uh, this mm -hmm. video or this podcast so you can check it out. But, you know, do you vet people? Like, do you try to make sure that they, they really have the right qualifications before they jump in? Or do you let them learn? And then, you know, you start to like really mentor the people that are, are ready to, to jump in and actually start working with brands. Yeah, so I thought about vetting people, but I decided, you know, it's kind of going to be difficult to do that because it's, it's actually hard to predict what's going to happen to any given individual. Like, for instance, let's say I meet somebody and I feel like their music is just not up to par today, but they're taking my master class, they're taking a bunch of other master classes, and they're gung-ho. They're in the kitchen cooking every day you know, like a true chef to be. And this person, you know, writes me back in three months and suddenly they're amazing, right? I mean, you, you just can never tell what's going to happen with folks. So I decided what I'm going to do is just give people a free training. That's what we do so that you get to know the world, you get to understand the world. I tell people, go out there, take a look at music production companies' websites. If you believe this is what you want to do, if you believe that you belong in this game, maybe not now, but maybe, you know, in some time, then you can participate in our academy. If for some reason you don't feel like this is for you, like you joined the academy and yeah, you realize this is not what you thought it would be. We offer everybody a no risk, no questions asked within 30 days, money back guarantee. But, you know, it's a difficult question that I struggle with for a while because I believe that it's always going to be a small percentage of musicians that, that I believe really have a chance to make an impact in the industry. And I was speaking to some friends and they said, you know, but your job is really just to put out the best 
possible teaching to prepare these folks as you can. The rest is really up to the people. And I thought about it and I, you know, I said, it's true. You know, it's, it's not as if prestigious schools try to predict what your success rate is going to be. No, right. they I just think focus. that's hard as educators. I'm the same way. It's like we want so much for our students to succeed that, that we're like, oh, should, you know, should I be doing more to make sure that this is really going to work for them? But there is a point where it really is up to them to take what you've given them and run with it. And, and you know, we give them opportunities to you know, ask for more help and you know, whatever it is they need because we care about the success of our students. But you're right. Like at some sure. point it is up to them. Yeah. And I actually, um, you know, there are all these like schools of thought that say what you got to do is constantly like um, uh, make sure the student is stimulated and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? That's not how like music masters taught their students. It's like, it's not up to me to motivate you. It's not up to me to ping you with an email to remind you that you should be doing the masterclass stuff. This is almost a way of me verifying like who's who. And so I had one person who asked me for a refund because they said, you don't send enough emails. <laughs> I was like, really? I don't send enough. Like normally I get complaints right. from the people on my email list that I'm sending too many emails. You know, the people who love our academy don't complain, but you know, there's always going to be somebody who complains. Um, but I thought that was very interesting. And I thought, I saw, I said, you know, what kind of emails do you want me to send you? Like, I don't understand. Our intention that the way we designed this thing was for there to be absolutely ev- like, we don't hold anything back. Absolutely. Every single thing that I know about my life's work is in there. Every single thing. If you actually follow the modules from the foundation to the craft, to the advanced craft, to the prep preparation, to building your reel, to building your website, and to actually learning how to reach out to industry professionals in our business. And if you have the talent, if you have the tenacity, I always say success might not be immediate, but it's going to be inevitable. Mm. And we're seeing that now. But I'm not going to prod any one of my students. I'm not going to say, hey, get to work. Because for me, this is a natural way of verifying okay, who's really motivated and who bought this thing, hoping that it will be a quick solution uh, to to turn their career around. There's no such thing. You know, it's never been easy to be a full-time musician. This is no exception. Right. And if they're not motivated to do the course, they're not going to be motivated to reach out to, you know, advertisers in the way that they need to, to actually get jobs, right? No, they all give up very soon because it's very difficult to actually connect with people in our industry and you know um, so some of my better students the the folks who actually do their homework the folks who reach out to me I give whoever uh, gets in touch with me my personal time so this master class is very different from a lot of online master classes where you basically buy the course and then you're left alone so to people who are not doing the work and who are not contacting me it may feel that way if you don't send me homework you're not going to hear from me But if you send me a question, if you send me homework, if you share your reel with me, if you share your website with me, I'm going to respond, you know? So every Friday I record videos for my students uh, where I'm actually listening to the music and they hear the music in my headphones and we're talking and I'm talking, I'm saying, you know, here's, you should try maybe a little, um, a little chord change here. Maybe try to switch up your instruments there really pay attention to the way the picture is developing here because your music is just rolling right over it. You're not acknowledging the cuts. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's kind of a bonus. Like people don't know that that's going to happen when they join the Academy, but then they get a video from me, like listening to their music and that's a pleasant surprise for them. I think that's so huge. I hear from so many people that, you know, they join a, a course like this that's supposed to help them with the business side, but it's related to music. And they're like, but they, ne- you know, they never listen to my music. So how would they know if my music will ever be successful? Yeah. So I think that that is a really huge bonus that you do that. Yeah. And, and then from there, when I'm hearing people who are really doing some incredible things musically, and I appreciate the way they communicate the, e- the kind of emails that they send, I'm like, 
these guys could uh, could succeed. So uh, some of them I will introduce to friends in the business and some of them I'll actually put under my wing, like under my production company, Tommy Z and Co. And um, I'll start mentoring them in whatever direction I think is best. So uh, some people are just meant to be composers. Like, you know, they just want to be in the studio. They don't actually want to interface with the uh, outside world. And some of them, I believe that they would be better producers than they would be composers. In other words, I, I try to groom them into somebody like me. So mm -hmm. somebody who's half in the studio listening to stuff. It's the best example I can give is like Chef Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay used to cook when he was in his mid-20s. And then he became a restaurant owner. And now he's running a big business that's based on his brand mm -hmm. as, a, as a top world-class chef. But the reality is he is grooming other people who he sees potential in and he lets them be the chef and he brings them under the brand. So that's kind of the model that I'm inspired by to basically use my name in the industry, whatever it's worth. You know, I've done a few things in our business. And, and so now I'm trying to give these folks that I think have potential credibility by putting them under my roof and, and trying to teach them. So, you know, we're early on with that. I mean, our academy has been running for about a year. We have 400 students, um, almost 20,000 people on the email list. So, so it's been, you know, a lot bigger of a response than I actually anticipated when I started this thing, because I thought this was going to be a real niche mm. subject. But now that I think about it, I guess I'm not surprised. And the reason is the traditional ways of, of earning a living, including touring. I mean, that's just being taken away suddenly and without warning for musicians, you know, because of the lockdown and things like this. And our industry is one where freelance musicians are literally making a living from their home studio. I mean, they don't have to leave their home studio to, to create music for Nike or Adidas or BMW because our industry has worked remotely for many, many, many years. And so, so I guess they see this as a potential opportunity. And, um, and, you know, it is. It's not a new opportunity. Making music for brands has been happening for a lot longer than many musicians think. Like that symbiosis, that synergy has always been there. You know, uh, early Wheaties uh, jingles on the radio. Like the stuff I could show you that just brings you a smile to your face, like how musicians are singing about America and cars. Mm. and how it's patriotic to buy a car and drive, you know, it's been there forever, you know. Um, it's just that most musicians don't really consider that. Like you said in the beginning, we all know commercials. We've even seen some cool stuff in commercials, but no one ever thinks, hey, it could be someone like me uh, actually doing this stuff. Yeah, for sure. And, I, you know, I think one question that I think my audience will have, and I kind of want to know, um, you know, a big popular topic right now is music licensing and you know sync placement and all that how does this differ from that are there any like back-end royalties with this or is it just like a work for hire kind of situation um it depends on where you are in the world so i've had the privilege of working in different parts of this world in this industry so my career started in north america and then i moved to europe and um uh, and I've also had a chance to work with uh, uh, Japan. A lot of my work comes from Japan. So I've seen it in different parts of the world. And in North America, a lot of it, a lot of making music for brands. So creating original songs, scores, or sounds from scratch is work for hire. In other words, the brand, usually it's the brand that wants to buy everything. They just want to have the rights to everything. And photographers and designers suffered that fate a long time ago. Musicians were holding on for a while with the royalty thing. But the reality is in a lot of places now, uh, it's going to be work for hire, where basically you get paid to create a demo. If this demo makes it, you're going to make a final fee. In North America, you could, always, uh, you could also get paid through um, what's called uh, the union, musician union. Mm. So this comes from kind of an older tradition where if you were working on, let's say, a Ford commercial in the 70s or 80s, there was no way to come up with the music unless you brought in a band into a studio 
and you had an orchestrator and you had a band leader and you had different kinds of musicians. And these musicians would belong to a union called American Federation of Musicians. Yeah. Yeah. AFM. Mm -hmm. and, and so for a long time, um, basically, the way the agency would pay for the music is they would give a AF of M credits to the music production company. And then the production company would share these credits, you know, orchestrator gets this much, band leader gets this much, piano player gets this much, depending on what their, I guess, impact is on the song or what their degree of contribution is. Hmm. So that has changed a little bit. So AF of M credits still exist, but what do you do with when the composer and the band leader and the orchestrator and the piano player and the synth player and the rapper is all the same person working yeah. on their laptop, right? So what happens today is that the music production company that gets the project from the agency might receive some AF of M credits. They might share them with a musician, but that's not always the case. It really depends on what the agreement is between the music production company and the musician. Sometimes they share, sometimes they don't. Um, and then when the campaign gets renewed and you are on an AFMM contract, you will receive money again. If you're not on an AFMM contract, last money you will see is the final fee that you got paid, which sometimes is very healthy. And so like, you know, um, it could be anywhere from 2000 to $10,000, depending on what the scope of the campaign is and where it's being aired. So when you talk about Europe, it's different because a lot of music production companies actually share royalties and the royalties are a real thing in places like Germany and places like Netherlands. Royalties are real. And so, so, uh, so a lot of uh, musicians, you know, they make a point of finding out, okay, how much, what's the split that I get? And then you will always split it with the music production company that is responsible for the thing in places like Asia uh, and some European countries like Italy and Spain, royalties are really tough to get. Eastern Europe, really tough to get. So really the majority of the money is going to come from that upfront payment, the demo fee and the final fee. Which and in some ways is great because you know what you're getting, you're getting it soon versus, yeah. you know, sometimes yeah. with like place sync, sync placements and stuff, you know, you're not getting it for months and months, you know, because yeah, your, yeah. your PRO is going to take forever. They do their quarterly thing. And, you know, it's, so it's like, it's kind of nice in a way, you know what you're getting, but then you're yeah. also not stacking that like, you know, income that comes in every month. Yeah. And I think um, if you can get a healthy amount of relationships going in the business, like the best composers in our business, you know, I have a, a guy named Naren who's a part of our masterclass. I do an interview with him because he, I put him up as a model. We started in the business in a similar time, um, like about 15 years ago. And he started as a composer and I started as a music producer. So he was a guy that got in touch with me early on in his career when he was still starting. And we've known each other and we've been working together ever since, you know. And it's a crazy to see his development from like, hey, here's a few spots that I did to like, you look at his website now and it's like the who's who, you know, and awards and all sorts of things are coming his way. And um, he basically has like 30 different music production companies that I, he has a relationship with. And every day he's writing a demo or two demos for some big brand campaign. And that's where his income is coming from. It's, it's quite steady. And then if you happen to write for a European music production company, you're not only going to get the lump sum, but, you know, the, the, the royalties then will be a bonus on top of that. It'll be like passive income that, yeah, maybe it'll come in, maybe it won't, but it'll be, you know, not, ex not in exchange for your time, um, mm -hmm. which is always nice when you get a check in the mail. Right. And it's uh, not something that you have to work for beyond oh, your original totally time. Is. So let me ask you, um, I know you have a production company and you learned early on that like as individuals, you don't go to ads agencies. You really need to have a production company. Do you also teach individuals how to become their own production company? Do you recommend they go seek out other production companies to work with? Yeah, I don't teach them how to become a music production company. 
it's mostly targeted toward freelance musicians, singers, songwriters, composers who want to create music. But I think some of these uh, guys and girls do end up realizing that there is such a thing as being a music producer. So, mm -hmm. and, and when I see that, maybe they're more talented in their music taste and the, their way of communicating rather than actually creating music from scratch then I point them that way. But that's not the focus of the course. The focus of the course is really like to show musicians behind the scenes every step of the way, what you need to do to break into the business. And maybe in the future, uh, that's going to be an idea, you know, to actually, for those who want to play a video game level higher, so not be looking for projects uh, from music production companies, but to actually go a step above and be a music production company and look for projects from agencies, that could be a future endeavor, you know? Um, but I really feel as if um, it's a rare human being that I think has all the necessary qualities to become a music producer, uh, a good music producer, a great music producer in our business. Mm -hmm. Because it requires, again, that unique combination of really being able to connect with the artists and be comfortable in a studio so that the artist trusts you or the composer trusts you. And at the same time, being able to take a conference call with the client and be able to talk strategically and to be able to talk diplomatically and to be able to, you know, talk the talk that you talk on a conference call. When I come across a human being like this, that's able to have the left and the right brain hemisphere completely in sync, they're just as business savvy as they are craft savvy, then, you know, I always want to snag them. I want to make them a part of my family uh, because it's a really good skill to have, you know? Yeah, I don't blame you. I mean, that's kind of, I'm a, I'm a weird person in music because I have that right and left. You know, I was a director of finance at an opera company for several years. That's and right. so, you know, you and I have a lot in common because we have that background of finance but yet we have the creative side that we've always had. And, you know, we let one take the lead for a while and then we let the other one take the lead, but it's so nice to have that other one in the back pocket, right? When you need it. Yeah. I think um, the more you can function that way. I mean, we have a right and a left hemisphere for a reason. Uh, yeah. I think some people just live in one side of their hemisphere and I don't think, you know, it's like we talked about those two wings. Um, Ideally, you want to take a look from different perspectives. So you want to be, uh, you want to be a mix of everything. You want to be a mix of art. You want to be a mix of commerce. Um, some people disagree with that. You know, like I get a lot of negative comments under uh, my ads um, for the academy, saying, "Why are you reducing art musicians to making commercials?" I mean man, this world is just getting sadder and sadder because of people like you. Um, you know, and I'm like, please don't take this so seriously. I mean, it's not as if I love advertising. <laughs> I'm not, it's not as if, you know, I'm some huge brand believer or something. All we're doing is finding our way as musicians in this world. What you do artistically may have nothing to do what you do what you do for a brand it's as if you were a sculptor and you were sculpting something high and mighty and beautiful and timeless but then you were hungry and someone came to you and said do you want to dig ditches for money or can you sculpt me something maybe you don't like what you're going to have to sculpt me but you'll still be in your shop sculpting yeah, and that's what like we're talking about Oh gosh, I know. It's just like when musicians say like, you're selling out if you're singing covers. It's like, no, if people want covers and they're going to pay you for that and you have bills to pay or you want to further the art that you're doing on the other side, that's your, you know, your own personal music that you've written that hasn't quite taken off yet. There is nothing shameful about singing covers at a restaurant because people enjoy that. You know, Absolutely. and the music is still going to move people. And I, 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 we should be so proud as musicians that advertisers want us because what we do moves people. Otherwise, they wouldn't pay for it. That's right. Yeah. And, and but, you know, it's always your choice what you want to do. So even if you are a part of this business, I mean, Feist, you know, she became 
well known because of the Apple commercial in the early 2000s that licensed one, two, three, four. And then McDonald's came along and said, hey, Feist, here's a million bucks. I bet you Apple didn't pay you a million bucks. <laughs> and Feist said, no, that doesn't like McDonald's. Mm. So you can do what you want to do. You don't have to compromise your values. But let's say you use an Apple computer to make music and Apple comes to you and says, hey, can you make us a track? I mean, why would you, like, why would you say no? I don't understand. Because people say, you know, um, for instance, some of these brands are exploiting people and they're doing all, all sorts of evil things. And it's true. Like some of these brands are doing negative things. But it's not necessarily condoning the evil things that the brand is doing. I mean, I feel it's kind of like strange for someone to be typing into their iPhone about how brands <laughs> like are maybe doing, like you just bought an iPhone. So you're condoning, if you don't believe what Apple's doing, you're also condoning it by buying the, the iPhone. So I just think like we need to be a little more, um, how do I put it? Uh, pragmatic about fulfilling our role as musicians. Mm -hmm. And like, basically my definition of selling out is this, maybe selling out is taking a paycheck from the man at a job that you don't even enjoy. Mm. So like I thought about this long and hard and again, it's this thing, right? Really can get you to clarify your thoughts about it so that when somebody approaches you, with these arguments, you've already sorted out your philosophy on it. So my philosophy was this, I just want to be in a studio. So if I need to do something for somebody else that's willing to pay me, and this might not be my favorite thing, I might not even think it's any good, like what they want, I'm still a craftsperson in the studio. And that to me doesn't feel like selling out. But to spend most of my life sitting in a cubicle or sitting behind a counter at some company where I'm not even passionate or I don't even feel like it's my life's calling, to be taking a check from there and then leaving music until last when I'm tired from my day job and I'm trying to create something. But like anyone that works a full job and then tries to create music at night knows like you're, it's just gone. You're, you're tired. Maybe that's selling out. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying. So, um, you know, I understand there are people who feel music is a sacred art. And I really respect that. I mean, I believe music can be a sacred art. But I don't believe music is just sacred art. To mm -hmm. say that music is holy and it's nothing else, I'm not sure that that's being a friend of reality. I think music is so vast and so comprehensive that it can play the role of a sacred art that can elevate your soul and make you more human and take your life into places you never imagined. But let's face it, it can also be elevator music. It can also be terrible on hold music. <laughs> it can also be annoying supermarket music. Uh, or it can be something in between. It could be really beautiful music that's a part of a public service announcement for a good cause. I mean, we can't reduce music to just one thing. And if somebody feels like the fulfillment of their life as a musician is to create music as a sacred art, then they should do so. Absolutely, they should do so. But don't think that those things are mutually exclusive. Don't think that you could, don't think that you have to just make music that is sacred art and never take a commission. You could do both. I have artists who work with me who are releasing music that is not for commercials. It is for artistic expression. They want to create an album. They want to move, move human souls. But then when they're done working on the album, they call me and they're like, Tommy, do you have any uh, projects from the commercial world? Because I'd sure love to uh, make up financially for three months working on, on, you know, my labor of love, which is actually costing me more money than I'm making from. So it's just about being smart, not being so radical, you know, about, um, but again, I'm not suggesting my philosophy should be someone else's philosophy. I'm just kind of, you know, giving you my philosophy on it. And it's quite pragmatic, you know, it's quite pragmatic. 
like Radiohead said, everything in its right place. So mm-hmm. keep the holy things holy. <laughs> if a brand's paying you a bunch of money to make a song, you know, think twice before you say no. Um, but don't compromise your values. That's for sure. Like never take a paycheck if you don't agree with what certain brand is doing. Just don't do it. I mean, that, that should be obvious, I think, to any person with integrity. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I think that's so great. And, and everything that you just said and throughout this whole episode is just really been inspiring i think for the right people it will inspire the right people to check below this video or this audio and go check out your free training go check out the academy if it's right for you you'll know because everything that tommy has been saying will resonate with you because he was pretty clear who he thinks it's right for and who he thinks it isn't right for so i want you to check that out you guys this has been so inspiring tommy and I just love the whole be a friend with a friend of reality like that just as musicians we need to do that all the time and yeah. and I you know I get plenty of people in my world that are not in that space yet and yeah, yeah. you know it, it you don't I was want there once. yeah I know and, and and I might be there again to be honest because sometimes we think we're a friend of reality but you know sometimes our our conviction is wrong and uh, maybe we don't have enough facts or I don't know, whatever the case may be, but humility is, I guess, a big thing that, that also helps. It's like always giving, uh, making some room for doubts and letting those doubts in because that's when you know you're going to make right decisions. If Be careful of, of, you know, just like gunning forward mm. without any hesitation. That's what I would say. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it's important to always check in with ourselves, you know, check in yeah. with ourselves and then have a mentor, you know, someone like you or myself or somebody else that's, you know, within this industry that has been around and, and has seen a lot of things and, and can give you a, a great perspective. And yeah, so, perspective you know, is huge. Like that's, that's what Tommy is here for. And he really does care about musicians. So I recommend you guys check out his free training his academy below and thank you know tommy thank you so much for spending this time with us i know it's going to be really valuable for i really appreciate uh, you having me and you're an inspiration to me because you you've been doing this online thing for a while and you know i'm kind of new to it but um it's definitely satisfying you know but i mean because it's new to me working with human beings and not brands like <laughs> brands i don't see i just send an invoice for music but now i have real humans counting on me um, and it's quite a, it was quite scary at first, but it's such a satisfying experience when you can take a person from A to B and you know all about that, right? So um, a great mentor, like you said, perspective, that's the biggest thing is a big uh, a mentor will tell you what you can't see about yourself because artists are stuck in their head. You may not see the weaknesses. You may not see the strengths. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what a mentor is there for. So Awesome. Yeah, I totally agree. It's almost like, you know, we're parents of the musicians, you know, and I think about that relationship of what I try to do for my own kids and yeah, you know, we yeah, really absolutely. care about getting them from A to B and also making sure that they're always checking in with themselves or being realistic and they are seeing both their weaknesses realistically and their strengths. So, yep. you know, reach out to us, you guys, if you, if you want any guidance for sure and go check out everything that relates to what Tommy is doing Uh, underneath this episode. Thank you so much, Tommy. Thank you so much, Bree. Take care. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.